Hey, hey everybody, Z Garcia here, and welcome back to Board Game Blender. Today we're going to be talking about games that have a lot going on, where everything was sort of shoved into the box, verging perhaps on having too many cooks involved. I, for one, love a game that is streamlined. You know, I love a game that where you can feel, you can, it's, it's, uh, it's apparent that everything that was not absolutely integral to the experience has been cut away. Now, those things sometimes get added back in in expansions, or a game after many expansions feels like it's had sort of too many cooks, too much input from too many people, you know? But some folks love that. The more the merrier, right? You want a game that you can, uh, you know, buy once and then play forever because there's so much variety in that box. Again, I don't necessarily fall into that camp, but I think lots of lots of people out there do fall into that camp. So we're gonna be, we're gonna be taking a look at games like that today, and hopefully you spot something that uh, speaks to you, that you find interesting and clever, and does give you tons of options and replayability. But before we do that, we're gonna take a look at a segment that is not really about too many cooks. In fact, it's about one cook, if you would our very own Sugar High score, and something fantastic that was created by, uh, uh, you know, from that segment, by that segment. So check this out. Again, this is uh, not really too many cooks. It's just the one, but it is gorgeous, and I wanted to include it in the episode. And then we'll talk about games that have a lot going on. So enjoy the episode. As always, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you in just a couple minutes. Hi everybody, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Shelby. Today we're making a cake that's the opposite of the theme of Board Game Blender because we were invited to make a cake for the Fireball Island party at Mox Boarding House here in Bellevue, Washington. So we wanted to make a cake to impress one of our favorite game designers, Rob Davio, with a cake you can play. So we're going to show you exactly how we made this cake and then we're going to take it over to the party. I can't wait to show you this. All right, let's get started. We first need to combine all our ingredients and get our cakes into the oven. The cake flavors that we're making today are lemon cake with blackberry filling and chocolate cake with chocolate ganache. We're cutting our cakes in half and filling them. I have the absolute best assistant. She always keeps me laughing. In the game, fireballs roll down the mountain down different paths, so we wanted to create a path on our cake too. So first, we have to cut away some of the cake at an angle to create a passage for a fireball. And then we used cake pop filling to build up an edge to help keep the fireball from falling off the cake. Next, I'm covering the cakes in fondant, and then I test it out. It works! To make it look more like the game, we need to add more details. I'm painting speckles on the rock, adding some fondant waves, hand painting the white water splashes, and making palm trees out of fondant. We can't forget about the heart of Volcar, which we made out of isomalt sugar. Ta-da! I cut out the Fireball Island logo out of fondant and airbrushed the letters to make them look like they're on fire. We also made an edible Volcar for the top of the cake. Edible Volcar was first sculpted out of rice cereal treats and then I wrapped it in modeling chocolate and gave him some eyes and some horns. If you eat him, you will then incur the wrath of Volcar. Let's stack up our cakes. We're almost finished. We just need to add the path and put the final details on the cake. It's time to test it. There were some fails, but also some wins. One more time. And now it's time to take it to our favorite board game cafe, Mox. This is where we buy all our games. Here's the game, Fireball Island, The Curse of Volcar. And here's the cake. That's me and my brother. Here, I'm pitching my idea for a legacy version of Fireball Island to Mr. Davio. I'm still waiting for him to get back to me on that. Thank you for watching our segment. We had the best time making this cake. If you would like to see even more baking videos, you can find that over on our own YouTube channel. 
If you have any other ideas on what we should make next, please tell us here or on our Twitter. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Hi, Board Game Blender. We're Chris and Lindsay from Behind the Box, and today we want to talk to you about a game that, despite having been made by just one person, feels like it was made by over 20 trying to all get their ideas involved. And that game is A Feast for Odin. So A Feast for Odin is a worker placement game where you and your opponents are all Vikings and the goal is to fill your player mat with the most stuff. So you'll be doing that by choosing from many different actions, for instance, hunting, exploring, and trading. And that's just the beginning. There's so much more to this game that we really can't go into because we just don't have the time for it on this video. <laughs> I just want to clarify as well. We actually like this game, so when I call it a bloated mess, I mean it in the most loving of ways. <laughs> but there is just so much happening in this game. So you have your player board that you have to fill with stuff. You can also go exploring, like you said. And there'll be island tiles that you can actually take and add, and they give you more resources each round. But you've also got to fill those with stuff. And then there's like farmlands and sheds and barns that you can take, and again, sort of add them to your player board. They give you more resources, but Again, you need to be filling them with stuff, otherwise these things will just all lose you points at the end of the game. And a lot of it just feels like there's just too much involved. <laughs> like the islands, for example. I think it's every other round or rounds two through three or four, something like that. The islands will actually flip over and become different islands with different point values and different resources. Why? <laughs> why? I don't understand why that needs to happen. Like That just feels like somebody suggested it and Uwe Rosenberg was like, Oh, yeah, okay. We can <laughs> sure, do that. let's get more islands out like, Yeah, and all the farm uh, tiles that you can collect. And yeah, it, as much as we like the game, it is a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. it certainly is a, a, a complicated thing. Yeah. And uh, just, just how complicated um, can be described in how many actions you have to choose from. There's over 50 actions to choose from in this worker placement game. Yeah. Um, so on the one hand, that's a good thing because... If somebody is taking up a certain action, there's always something else that you can be doing that will help you. But on the other hand, it's paralyzing how many actions you have to choose from. It's so hard to choose because you're not quite sure which path is the right one, what's going to help you the most. Oh, it is frustrating. <laughs> it is a little bit, yeah. And I think as somebody trying to learn this game, especially we don't play a lot of worker placements, we don't play a lot of heavy Euro games, it's hard to understand where you went wrong mm -hmm. and try and correct it in future games because there's so many actions you don't know which one was the wrong choice yeah. to make if you didn't win the game and so that's kind of a negative to it for us just because <laughs> it's not typically our type of game but like i said we do enjoy this game and if you have a hot mess and there's just a bloated mess of a game that you enjoy <laughs> then leave it down below for us in the comments we love seeing all these sorts of comments with you. yeah and if you're hungry for more board game discussions then you can always check us out on our social media but until next time see you later bye, bye. For today's game Under the Radar, I'm going to be taking a look at Desert Island from publisher Guerrilla Games. In this game, four to six players are all stranded on an island trying to survive. But there's a lot more going on than that. You see, every character on the island has someone that they secretly love and they want them to succeed. Part of your score will be based on that. And there's someone that they secretly hate and they want to see them just go away. And again, part of your score is based on that. Now this, if that sounds familiar maybe, or uh, perhaps it doesn't, but uh, you, uh, I want to make you aware of it, this is a follow-up to another game from the same designer, also from Guerrilla Games, called Lifeboat. And in that game, you were all sh on a lifeboat after a shipwreck, trying to survive. And again, you had a character you loved, a character you hated, you would be drawing goods from a deck of cards. You would be adding cards to the end of that deck to see if someone maybe fell overboard the, the boat. If, uh, you know, fights would break out as you would attempt to move positions from, say, somewhere in the middle of the boat to the front. You wanted to be near the back of the boat so you could control uh, events, you know, things like people falling overboard or, or thirst. That was a big thing. And so this game takes that those concepts uses the same characters where there is a first mate there is a captain that is always the captain no matter where you are on the on the boat 
uh, you know, people who were on the uh, original ship that then were on the lifeboat and now ended up on this island. So you take those characters, you still have someone you hate and someone you love, but now there's a lot more going on. Now the locations, where before it was simply a lineup on the, on the lifeboat, now each one has something assigned to it specifically. And so, for example, you've got uh, here, uh, step two, for example, is the jungle. And the jungle says that the character at this location needs three less food during hunger. Or you've got the hill, you know, location five, uh, which says when you take the signal fire action, you may add an additional fire token. Uh, things like that, a little bonus. And you've got a deck of cards that uh, you are going to be drawing from and uh, events happen, but they're also, uh, you know, good things, good things you can use to benefit you to increase your score so that if you're still alive at the end of the game, you have a much higher score. There's a ton going on and this feels like everything in Lifeboat plus a ton of other new things, but nothing... Uh, was trimmed away and I do want to mention before I go on that I do like this game better than Lifeboat I actually think it's it's uh, a little better conceived. It's a bit more interesting But if this is your first introduction to the game and you never played the original It's going to feel like there's a ton going on and like maybe not every idea that was had along the way Had to end up in the game the original game also suffered a little bit from a lack of rules clarity. It was tricky to to figure ex everything exactly out. You know, it attempted to give you a great situation, but the rules, especially for combat, were a little uh, muddy. And this, unfortunately, carries that over as well, just a little bit, you know. So, there you go. That is Desert Island. Definitely a game that does not get a lot of attention. The first one got a little bit of attention, Lifeboat. And this one less so than that, it would seem to me. But it's a fun one if you want that kind of in-your-face, taking your spot, stealing your goods interaction with six players. Definitely the best number to play with, six players. So that's it for me. Desert Island, check it out if you enjoy that style of game. Uh, two under the radar for me. It needs more attention. I'll see you next time. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Hey everyone, my name is Chris and this is the Teacher's Lounge. Now, if you're like me, you'll notice that I'm in fact not in the Teacher's Lounge, but a hotel room for a business trip where I am far, far away from my board game collection, my friends, and my family. But I do have eight pillows to myself, so I'm gonna build some forts. But also, if you're like me, you teach a lot of board games to your friends and to your family. So the Teacher's Lounge is a place where we teach teaching recommendations. Uh, tips for getting better so that you and your friends can jump into the fun of games quicker. Now today's topic, games with bloat, games that have maybe perhaps too many cooks in the kitchen that are a little bit too cram-packed. I'm gonna pick a kind of controversial pick because a lot of people like this game, and that is Lorenzo Il Magnifico. I love how smooth this game is, don't you? It's I pretty agree. Fun. You feel that? Now, before I continue, I will clarify that I do consider Lorenzo El Magnifico to be a good game and a good design, but I do feel like it is a little bit overstuffed, and I'll walk you a little bit through why. Lorenzo is a worker placement game where you roll dice to determine the strength of your workers, but you also have a tan worker who is worth zero strength and he's terrible. Every turn you will grab cards, and they have instant effects and later benefits, but you cannot grab two cards from the same column. But you can if you use your tan worker, but if you also grab a card where there's another worker in a different color, then you have to pay extra, and there's some of those problems. Well, anyway, ignoring that, green and yellow cards are used to build engines. But if you want to get more green cards, you have to have enough military strength in order to be able to place those green cards into your collection. But yellow cards, you can have any number of, just like in real life. Now, on the religion track, you have to be able to move your marker every other round, not every round, to, uh, past where the tile is on top. And if you do not make it past that point, you will get excommunicated up to three times, just like in real life. And you will have terrible lasting effects for the rest of the game. And then you can also take an action where you take your worker uh, of a 
certain level and you run an engine. You place a worker and whatever the level that die is, you run that level of card and lower. So if you don't have a high enough level, then you can't run certain cards in your engine. You can of course spend resources to boost the strength of any worker and you have to if you're going to use your tan one. And once again, you can't run an engine with two of the same color. You can use your tan ones a second time though. There's just a little bit too much and there's 16 cards that you can grab each round and at the end of each round, the cards don't just shift down like in most games. All 16 cards get wiped out and all 16 are replaced. So over the six rounds, you will see 16 new cards that you can grab every single round. I consider Lorenzo to be a good game, but it is just a little bit clunkier and there's just a few more mechanisms in it than I expected there to be. I thought this would be a fantastic middleweight game and it's just a little bit heavier and clunkier and has a few, uh, that whole religion track is ripped straight out of Grand Austria Hotel and, and copy and pasted right on here. There's a little bit I wish was uh, smoother and simpler to get into with this game. Now a teaching recommendation is that if you're going to teach a game that is uh, that has a lot of moving parts, is a little bit more complex like this, then it's totally okay to spend two minutes and just read over the rule book, or five or ten minutes. People say, hey, Chris, you know how to play Lorenzo Al Magnifico. Could you teach it to us? Uh, I could probably teach it better than I can seem to pronounce it right now. I could say, sure, but you know what? Tell me what. Give me uh, ten minutes to look over everything. I, I want to make sure to teach everything correctly in there because there's a lot of small rules. There's a lot of little exceptions, and I would hate to miss one of those and make your first time playing it uh, nuanced or, or like incorrect, right? So a lot of people feel like to be a good games teacher, you have to be able to teach any game in your collection. This would work better if I was in front of a wall of games. Any game in your collection without looking at the rule book. And that's bogus, right? That is just incorrect. A good games teacher is someone who will teach all the rules correctly and make sure that people have a fun experience when they first play a game. It is not fun to be halfway through a game and, and hear, oh, you know what I forgot about? Or, oh, we've been doing that wrong this whole time. So it's totally okay to spend a little bit of time and review the manual. It's okay to ask people for a few minutes ahead of time, especially if you're just kind of uh, thrown on the spot. Oh, hey, you know how to teach Dead of Winter. Is that a game that you want to just kind of try and remember all the rules to? Spend a little time and look over the rule book if you need and just feel okay asking for that. Well, that's my teaching recommendation for Lorenzo Al Magnifico and for other games that have a lot of little rules, especially like exception type rules to them. So if you have any recommendations yourself, feel free to comment below. I'll be responding under the name Meeple Overboard, the podcast that my wife and I do together. Hope to see you around. Have a great one. Hey guys, I'm Ben. And I'm Tommy. And we're talking board games. And this week on Blender, we are looking at games with too many cooks in the kitchen, which too means there's many. too much going on. Too much. Alas. Yes. And our game of choice today on Consider, Consider the, the Comments is none other than Thunderstone Quest, recent <laughs> Kickstarter release from AEG. Can you make stars come out of my hand when I do this? Maybe. Or <laughs> rainbows or unicorns. Okay, well, I'd appreciate it if you didn't do that. None of the above. Why don't you take the lead, Ben? I have a comment from Larsder. Larsder. He rated the game a nine. He says, oh, by the way, before I laptop to the one guy who commented about my phone making him twitch, problem solved. There you go. Good go, Ben. Thank you. Larsder said, I really like this game. Right now, this has to be my favorite deck building game. Clank held that spot previously. Now, what can we take from this comment? Nothing. Everything. Ignore Larsder. A. I don't think he's played any of the previous Thunderstones. He didn't mention it. Most people do in the comments. Sure. And B. Clank was his previously, was previously his favorite deck builder. So you have a baseline for which he compared this game, and he likes it better. Still only a nine though. I've got a pretty good contrast to that. I've got Joseph seven 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 here from Joseph seven 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 from Perth, Australia. Ah. Switch to Clank seriously. Everyone will have an awesome time and kill plenty of monsters and gain lots of loot on the way. Win or lose, mm. it's always good fun. Interesting. So, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Thunderstone Quest, uh, there's a lot going on. A lot. 
It takes the original game of Thunderstone, adds a village with actual locations where you go and visit that gives you a special action you can take. Worker placement. So you've got a slight worker placement. Once again, it's a deck building game, so a lot of deck management going on as you're upgrading heroes and whatnot. You also have the actual physical dungeon now, mm -hmm. which you can traverse via various paths, I guess you could call them, which is a step up from the previous version. And rather than have just the resources that are innate on the cards, you actually have physical, tangible resources that you can collect and cash in and use for various things. So it definitely uh, takes what used to be a pretty straightforward deck builder, a la Dominion, and ramps it up to something that is... Is it still a deck building game? For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think this is probably my favorite deck builder as well. I'm going to have to side with Lars Durr here. Lars Durr. Um, You've spoken truth. I think this is probably the best, like, solid, like, just deck builder. Okay. Um, we've got a full review of the video um, if you want to go and watch it, uh, which I encourage you to do so. Um, but this is, I mean, this does it really well, in yeah. my opinion. Uh, the, 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 the deck management and the cards that you're constantly mm -hmm. upgrading, and I just think it works really Despite well. Despite everything that's going on, it still feels like a card game. Right. But it's a little extra. And it's clean. It doesn't yeah. seem, it seems very streamlined. I haven't played any of the previous previous ones, so I don't know how it compares. But I think it I think it works really well, and it's it's a clean game yeah. that I don't mind taking out and playing and spending a decent amount of time playing. So all of you viewers out there, have you played the previous Thunderstones? Have you played Thunderstone Quest? How do they compare? Does this game have too many cooks in the kitchen? Tell us in the comments. We'd love to hear your opinions. Make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe, and go check out all the contributors, and we'll see you guys next time. See ya. We're looking specifically at Thunderstone. Today on... Quest. T <laughs> Today on what, Ben? Today on... Hey, I'm Ben. <laughs> We're starting over. <laughs> okay, we're well, We've got to do Consider the Comments. Yeah, but you're catching me off guard. As you're as catching we can. me off guard. We finished this week on Blender. We're looking to fix in the kitchen. And okay. today <laughs> on Consider... Sheesh. All right. Getting... No, but today on... Oh, man. Blew it. Retake. Starting from the beginning. Today on... Oh, we're starting from no, the beginning. The beginning oh. Hey guys, I'm Ben. And I'm Tommy. And we're talking board games. And today on Consider the Com... Oh my gosh, <laughs> what the heck? For today's quirky game, I'm taking a look at Legendary Encounters. Specifically, two games in the Legendary Encounters family of games. And that is this one here, Aliens. Uh, and this one, the Predator, Legendary Encounters predator deck building game now uh the thing that makes this quirky and i think fits perfectly on this episode is the fact that there is so much content and not just each of these games but combined as well because you can do that you can combine these two games and play in a setting in a world that has both the aliens and the predators and that sounds amazing and it is it is cool but there is so much content in the game. So I have here is uh, uh, in my box. This is everything combined for the two games: two play mats, a bajillion cards, and the standard way to play either one of these on their own is you as the characters from the movies, and they they feature all the movies here, right? Uh, you know, uh, fighting against whichever side you're doing. So aliens, for example, you are you might be on the you Nostromo. Know, fighting off the aliens and you know scanning the the halls looking for where the aliens are things like that defending yourself while of course building a deck of cards to get stronger and everyone is working together to do this for the most part but that's just one mode in the game besides that you've got you know uh you can play for example in the uh, in the predator one you can play where you are the predators you can play in which you are, you know, fighting off against the humans. So you're just flipping sides, and there's a whole new set of rules for that. You can play one in which you combine that idea with aliens, and there's a whole thing for that. Uh, in which you, and there is then the, the idea also that you get a, a face hugger, and then you might be an alien yourself. And it's, you know, it, it's just... 
there's so much content. Is that good? Yeah, I mean, I like getting more content for a game, but each of these things has a, a lot of new rules you need to internalize, you know, and, and things you ignore, things you do instead of, uh, you know, spots on the board that you use, on these, these playmats that you use for one mode, but not for another mode, or a different type of card goes in this clearly labeled section that is not that kind of card for this mode you're playing. And so that's what I mean by, you know, kind of too many cooks. There's too much. Uh, it feels like the designers were so inspired by this setting that they wanted to put everything in the box. And, and they did. And that's not necessarily bad instead, except that... I fall into one of two camps, just kind of depending on the game session I'm having. Either I'm uh, feeling like there's so much game that I'm not utilizing in the box, you know, because of everything I'm not ready to teach to new players, or I do try to explore that stuff and just have a really hard time getting folks to understand what's happening, you know, to sort of get into it and, and uh, grasp everything. Usually it's that that the former. I just uh, I tend to do the same style of play each time I sit down and play the game because I'm usually teaching new folks and some of the other you know the combination modes and you are the predators modes are a little trickier to to figure out and and have go smoothly. So that's how I feel about it. I have kept both though and I haven't combined into a single box here as you can see. I like all the contents in there. I think it's a uh, it's a nice thematic game for being just a deck building game, which are usually not very thematic designs. Well, this one's got a great theme and uh, it is engaging, it's interesting. There's just a ton going on and you need to know that it's gonna be tricky to explore everything in it if you are a fairly casual gamer. Uh, and by that, I mean teaching new people how to play uh, all the time, that sort of thing. So there you go. This is my quirky game of the episode. Again, just because there's so much in it. But if you enjoy the theme here, either one really, or both, I would certainly say check it out because it's a ton of fun. And uh, uh, while it's a, a long game and there's a lot of involvement in it, it can be very rewarding. So thanks for checking this out. I'll see you next time. Welcome to Bickering Over Board Games, where we talk about trends in board gaming and how we feel about them. The uh, theme for the blender this week is too many cooks, so that's like maybe too much influence, maybe too many designers, or the... Are you making fun of me? No, I um, was putting more hands in. Well, for me, right away, I thought of um, a game we recently played and loved and just back, Dinosaur Island. Because All in, baby. Even though it was fun and I'm excited to play it more, I really think that the podcast um, Blue Peg, Pink Peg hit the nail on the head when they talked about how there's just so much for how little you're actually doing, for how much meat there is in the game. Just some components felt unnecessary. So there's this delicate balance, um, like the force, uh, where you need decision points proportionate to mechanics. It's a collaboration between John Gilmore and ah, I, this person whose name is escaping me. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, just those two. And it's also a Kickstarter game. And so I think we see, as trends go, I feel like we're seeing more collaborations. And then I also think, and we've talked about this before, but in Kickstarter campaigns, you know, Kickstarter games produce a lot of content. But with the collaboration, I mean, John Gilmore and who else was on Wasteland? Wasn't it John Gilmore and someone else? Matt Riddle and Ben Pinchback. Oh, so not John Gilmore at all? No, John oh, Gilmore, okay. Matt Riddle, and Ben Pinchback. I mean, I think designers. that that game right there. is awesome. I know, I can't read it though. Oh, okay. Um, I think that that she game can read. is, <laughs> thank you for clarifying, is awesome. And it doesn't feel like there's too much going on. No. <laughs> and then there's also, like, my favorite game is Dead of Winter, um, specifically because of the people that we play it with. And I just think it's a really, especially the base game, is so... Oh yeah, that's a good is point. Is so tight and so... So again, a collaboration between <laughs> Isaac Vega and uh, John Gilmore. Apparently we're John Gilmore fans, <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't even realize know. that. Uh, but I, I mean, I am thinking like, a lot of these collaborations do seem to be smooth. It's almost like the designers give each other a critical eye and they mm -hmm. say, okay, that could go. Or, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean... And that helps you... I mean, I'm sure that they get attached to things mm -hmm. and don't want to cut them. So to have someone else be like, it's okay, you can release that idea. Yeah, um, exactly. Anyways. So I do feel like it's happening. You know, I mean, yeah. there's Eric Lang is collaborating and others are collaborating. And Eric Lang, left on his own devices, has created perhaps a game that I think... But I think that that's part of the Kickstarter model, too. Rising Sun. For me, what makes that game fun is the over-the-table interactions with the group that we're playing with. Not necessarily how big my monster is. And I never purchase the monsters because I'm so, not an aggressive player. And most of the time, I'm just trying to, like, keep my honor high and I'm killing myself a lot. So, to be clear, I think... I've never won. I'll put that out there, too. <laughs> I think if there's too much going on in that game, it's not too many mechanics. I want to be really clear. No. I think that the amount, again, of action points to mechanics is spot on. But potentially, arguably, there's too much content. Mm -hmm. As in, there's more monsters, especially if you have the Kickstarter version. Um, than we'll ever need. Um, <laughs> I like it, but I, I get the criticism. Mm -hmm. I mean, could Rising Sun fit into one box and have slightly smaller miniatures and be just as fun? Yeah. And maybe easier to get to the table. Yes. A hundred percent. But I not I don't wanna see I don't wanna live in that world. Well and maybe that's the problem. Maybe we're the problem. Maybe wait. I'm this half of the 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 couch is the problem, <laughs> if you will. This uh, half of the couch. Uh is <laughs> Better. We want the stuff, so maybe it's our own fault that games sort of maybe feel clunkier than they need to or more fiddly than they have to, because bring me the stuff. I think you just figured it out. <laughs> well, uh, Way to take responsibility. On that note... Cheers! And that's going to do it for us, everybody. A big thanks to all my contributors. A big thanks to you, of course. Thanks for tuning in and being a part of our little Blender family. And as always, I'm going to see you again in a couple of weeks for our next Board Game Blender episode. Stay tuned for that. And hey, don't forget, stay a friend of the blend. I'll see you next time.